Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Joel, chapter 2. We're going to read the first 11 verses. We're going to consider the road to brokenness, the road to brokenness. So beginning in verse 1, it says this, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they turn, run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this morning as we consider this road to brokenness. What we're finding here is that the, the invasion in chapter 1 is now being threatened by a second literal locus invasion following hard on the heels of the first invasion. Possibly uh, the very next season, it made it specifically very horrific because they're still reeling from the first invasion, one that was so significant that it was one that they had to tell uh, to their uh, fathers and and uh, to their children and and their children's children. So that was a significant one. But what the Lord is telling them is actually, you ha we could put it this way: you haven't seen anything yet. There's more to come. There's a second invasion coming. This this army of chapter two is decidedly more severe invasion of locusts than the past one. In fact, uh, we've confirmed this uh, already, but uh, chapter 2, verse 25 is very significant. He says to them, a promise here, if they will repent, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. So in other words, it wasn't a one-off thing. There was years when the locusts were eating away their produce. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent amongst you. And again, clearly this army is an army of locusts. That's why he uses the same terminology that he used in the opening of chapter one, talking about the canker worm, caterpillar, palmer worm, so on and so forth. So clearly it's a locust invasion. It's God's army. So he's behind it. And so he identifies it clearly uh, for us that it's a second locust invasion. And of course, this number two in the same campaign, all with the same purpose, and that is to bring these people to repentance. So the Lord is chastening his people. The Lord is, uh, because he loves them and he wants them back in complete harmony with himself. And so he's bringing these things to get their attention. We already mentioned that the tenses in chapter one are past. 
the tenses in chapter two are future. In other words, this is still to come. They're going to come, and we saw verses like verse five. It says, like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, shall they leap. Uh, verse seven, they shall run uh, like mighty men. They shall climb. So in other words, it's something that's coming. It's not happened yet. And yet he also emphasizes a very significant word in verse 12. He says, therefore, also now. And so what he's saying is this invasion is coming, but actually, if they would repent, God himself would repent of the judgment and stop it. And so there's certainly the reason for this, this threat of the second invasion is, again, to bring them to repentance. It can be avoided if they will truly repent. Many have kind of thought about this as really a human army uh, rather than a locust invasion. And I want to show why this could not be the case. And I think it's, it's very simple. But if, if you look at verse 7, when he says, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war. The very fact that he uses the term like <laughs> implies that they're not mighty men and they're not men of war. They're like them. And so clearly what he's using is using that as a descriptive term, like this invasion of locusts is like a, a military invasion uh, in the sense that it resembles that, but it isn't one. It is an invasion of uh, locusts. Now, we, we would say this, that when he talks about the day of the Lord, coming and it's near at hand what we could say is that this locust invasion at the very least is a foreshadowing of a coming day of the lord okay so we'll point that out as we go through that some of the things it's clearly is a literal invasion of literal locusts but there are things that we can see in this that will remind us that there's a coming eschatological day of the Lord, and there are certainly some definite foreshadowings in this. And often you see that in prophecy, uh, in a sense, prophetic events uh, cast their shadows, in a sense, and they're backwards. And so we'll see that there's some definite connections here of, of the coming day of the Lord. So his words may not be completely exhausted. In fact, we read of a northern invasion in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39. And maybe that's kind of a foreshadowed here, this invasion coming in from the north. And we'll think about some of those things as we proceed. So this locust plague was a precursor of greater a day to come, the terrible day of the Lord, which is to come on not just the land of Judah, by the way. This, is, this invasion is restricted to Judah, the coming day of the Lord is going to be much wider in its impact, but at least it gives us an idea of what it would be like. So just to give a quick overview of verses 1 through 11, because I think sometimes it's just good to get the big picture before we kind of go into the specific details. And so this quick chapter or quick section overview, we're going to start with this. It begins with an alarm sounding, like a, a siren goes off, a warning signal. And the reason is, an army, an invading army of these locusts has been spotted. It's on its way. It's very close at hand. It's coming over the mountains, swiftly descending on the countryside, leaving the whole district like a scorched earth, uh, like the Garden of Eden ahead of it, we're going to see, and behind it, it's like a fire has burned and everything is left like a barren wilderness. We're going to see that the, these locusts are going to march in an unbroken formation they keep going no matter what obstacles are in the way they just keep on keeping on just cleaning up everything in their way bringing the maximum of distress and destruction so horrific that we're going to see when we get to verse 10 he uses language that looks like it's apocalyptic uh, the darkness that and the gloominess of the day and again it ends with this this climax, really, where the Lord in verse 11 will identify who the commander of this army is. And it's none other than the Lord himself. He is the one who is leading this army. He's the one that's bringing it. This is definitely divine chastening 
of his covenant people. Just as he promised back in Deuteronomy 28, that if they got away from him, there would be chastenings, there'd be cursings, and this is one of those things. And so clearly that's what's in view here. So now we've kind of looked at the big overview. We're going to kind of hone in now on, on the actual references, the particular verse by verse. And so we begin with this blowing of the trumpet in Zion. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Joel's already introduced this topic of the day of the Lord, and now he's going to elaborate on it and show us that, again, this is when God steps in. Again, God is leading the army. God is doing this. God is stepping into the affairs of man. He's letting his presence be known. Uh, certainly in judgment here, this is what is going on. This 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 invasion is God is behind it. So he begins with this trumpet sound. And of course, the trumpet, that's the word here for trumpet is the word we're familiar with. It's the shofar, the ram's horn. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm. And this same trumpet was used, by the way, when they marched around the walls of Jericho, remember? And they, they blew the, the trumpet seven, and it was the ram's horn that they blew. And yet, ironically, this is not Jericho that the alarm is being sounded for. This is actually Zion. This is Jerusalem. This is the city of God that is going to be invaded. And so that makes it uh, amazingly significant. And so this city of Jerusalem, an alarm is announcing imminent danger. Just like today, I suppose, in Israel, no doubt, as rockets come in from Hezbollah and from the different places, one of the first things that will happen is an, an alarm, like an air raid siren will go, go off, warning them to take shelter, warning them that there's imminent danger coming their way in this area every week. Uh, we have an alarm goes off, and it's a, a tornado warning alarm. It's just letting us know what that sound is. Get familiar with it. Uh, it's a, given at a certain time every week, so we know when to expect it. But if you hear another time, you take shelter. Danger is on its way. And so that's the idea. Blow the alarm. Uh, sound, the, blow the trumpet uh, in Zion. And when they hear it, notice what he says. When the people hear this, he tells us they are to tremble. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. This siren call will strike terror into the whole community without exception. And as you think about it, they've already, they're, they're still, as it were, licking their wounds from last year's invasion. <laughs> and now here comes another one. And you can imagine uh, they they know what it's about. They've experienced it. And so you can imagine all the inhabitants of the land, terror striking them without exception. Everybody uh, struck with terror. Of course, it's Zion where this trumpet is to be sounded. First time it's mentioned, it's going to be mentioned six times. We've already mentioned throughout this prophecy. Of course, it's uh, that special place. In fact, the last verse of the book mentions Zion. Uh, chapter 3, verse 21, I'll cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Why is Zion so significant? It's because it's the place where God had chosen to place his name. It was his dwelling place. Uh, it was his holy mountain. Notice again, blow the alarm, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. And so this is the place that is the center, really, of God's dealings on the earth. And this is the place that is about to experience imminent judgment of this second locust locus plague. All of God's interests on the earth really center in this place, Zion. That's where, by the way, and we love this verse, Psalm 2, verse 6, yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That's the very place where the Lord Jesus is going to reign over the whole earth from. And that's why it's such a significant place. It's my holy mountain. Of course, it identifies it clearly as Jerusalem. It's the dwelling place of God. And perhaps this is the, the issue that many considered that Jerusalem would be safe because hey, this is where God dwells. And so it must be safe because God lives there. And of course, uh, that's you find that 
frequently. Uh, the, the judgment that Je Jeremiah pronounces, and one of the things that people held on to was the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, God's never going to judge this place because this is God's dwelling place. But actually, the very opposite is true. Because God has placed his holy presence there, he cannot be indifferent to sin. So when when Jerusalem is filled with, as we've said, the, the sin of apathy and complacency and ritualism and going through the motions and losing the sense of reality of, of the presence of God amongst them, what, what option does he have? He must discipline. He must chasten his people. But by the way, we need to recognize, too, the place where we meet is a place where God has chosen to place his name there. And therefore, we dare not and we cannot be indifferent to sin because it's the place where we gather. We're, we're meeting on holy ground. That's where the Lord has promised to be. And so we need to keep that sense of reverence and fear uh, because God is in our midst. And therefore, we, we cannot and dare not become complacent about sin. Notice it's no false alarm because he tells us the day of the Lord cometh. It is near at hand. It is so close. It's unmistakable. It's it's God's day. Uh, it's the day of the Lord. He's bringing it. It's imminent. It's unmistakable. It's divine. And so they're to sound an alarm. Who's going to sound the alarm? Most likely, Joel himself is being told to sound the alarm. Like Ezekiel, he's like a watchman stationed on the walls. And, and his job is to warn the people of what is coming. And so he takes his responsibility seriously. He blows the trumpet sound and he, he gives the message. And again, we're reminded of Ezekiel. Let's just go back there just to see this idea of the watchman on the wall. Uh, it's really important to recognize the solemn responsibility uh, of being one who warns when judgment is imminent and so we notice verse well beginning verse one he says ezekiel 33 1 again the word of the lord came unto me saying son of man speak to the children of thy people and say unto them when i bring the sword upon a land if the people of the land take a man of their course and set him for their watchman if when he sees the sword come upon the land he blow the trumpet and warn the people then Whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And so it's a solemn thing, isn't it, to be a watchman, to, to warn of impending danger. And we need to recognize our responsibility to do that. In the New Testament context, I think of 1 Corinthians 14, 8, if the trumpet given on certain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? It's the same language, right? It's, a, it's an attack is coming. Who that fails to warn, it's a serious thing. And so, again, we need to be careful. It's very easy for those that minister the word of God to have our favorite subjects, our favorite messages, you know, kind of things we're comfortable with, things that we know Christians will enjoy, and we just give them what they want to hear rather than warning of the dangers of the hour in which we live. And we need to have that certain sound, that, that clear peal of the trumpet to let people know the dangers that they face in a day like today. And so we need to be courageous and warn people and speak ministry that's relevant uh, to where we find ourselves in these last days, these difficult, difficult days. And so this is the warning sound that is given. The trumpet blast is given. So verse 2 he begins to describe this coming day of the Lord. What is it like, this locust invasion? He says it's a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains 
And so just as the morning spreads upon the mountains, now he's using the, the idea of that slowly but surely it covers the whole land. It begins on the mountains and spreads over it. Well, he's saying this darkness is going to come, but it's going to cover the whole land, just the same as where the morning light, uh, as it were, sheds light on the whole land. This day of darkness, gloominess, day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there are not been ever the like, neither shall any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So again, we've said it's not merely an arrival of human enemies. This is an encounter with the Lord himself. In fact, he's using language here that is descriptive of the God of Sinai, the very language uh, would take us back to the book of Exodus. I want you just to go there to Exodus 19. When God appeared on Mount Sinai, he, the very similar language is used to what Joel uses here, verses 16 through 18. And the implication is that behind all this, this invasion is none other than the God of Sinai. And so it says in, in um, chapter 19 of Exodus, verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain and the Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended in the smoke of a furnace. The whole Mount quaked greatly. And so you get this idea that this description is kind of, this is God that's bringing this. And so uh, it says it is a day of darkness and gloominess, just like the big thick blackness that hung over Mount Sinai. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong, there hath not been ever the like. So again, this these terms certainly bring back to their remembrance Sinai. And of course, God of Sinai is executing his righteous judgment. A parallel scene of darkness is also seen in other scriptures that talk about the day of the Lord. I want to just look at the other kind of cross-references to the day of the Lord to see that usually this is the language that is connected with it, a day of darkness and gloominess so we've already looked at this in the past but let's go back to isaiah 13 very definitely a parallel passage it won't be the first time or the last time we'll go back here but again verses 6 through 10 of isaiah 13 it says this how ye for the day of the lord is at hand it shall come as a destruction from the almighty therefore shall all hands be faint Every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven, the constellations thereof, shall not give their light. The sh sun shall be darkened in his going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. So again, you get this idea of a time of thick darkness. The sun's not shining. The moon's not giving her light. Uh, a time of great fear, great judgment. This is the picture that's before us. Let's go again, please, to another uh, Old Testament prophet, not far from Joel, Amos. Again, where we get this same language, Amos chapter 5 and verse 18. Through 20, it says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. So what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him and went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? And then one more uh, minor prophet Speaking of the day of the Lord, this would be Zephaniah and Zephaniah chapter one and verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. Zephaniah 1 14. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of 
wasteness. Uh, sorry, day, sorry. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. So you can see as you put these scriptures together, the day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloominess and thick clouds and a day of divine judgment in every way. And so initially this locust horde is seen in the far distance as a large, thick, foreboding black cloud. But as it comes closer, a shimmering light can be detected. So this thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. And many have suggested that when you see locusts come initially, it is like a dark cloud. But then as they get closer, you actually can see the sun shimmering on their wings. And so it kind of changed the, the picture and the image here. And so they're like a people, uh, great and strong. Uh, that's language we saw in the Previous chapter, chapter 1, verse 6, a nation is come upon my land strong and without number. So again, it's like a, a people that are great and strong that are coming, uh, a great people and strong. And then he says, there's not been anything like this, neither shall be any more after it. If the previous locust invasion was bad, this is going to be so much worse, so much so that as you look back or you look forward, you won't find anything like it. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even of the years of many generations. So this is clearly a unique locust plague, nothing to be compared with it. They've never seen anything quite like it. And so it's it's unparalleled. We would say it's unparalleled in the, the severity of this locust judgment. And again, we said that this passage foreshadows the prophetic day of the Lord. And I want to, again, just look at a couple of well-known scriptures that talk about what that day will be like. One in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where we read these words in Daniel 12 and verse 1. It says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So again, notice that time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And of course, you know where I'm going next. The words of the Lord Jesus, Matthew 24 and verse 21, where he talks about this great tribulation that's coming, which will be the day of the Lord, eschatologically and prophetically. It says, for then shall there be great tribulation, Matthew 24, 21, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It's always good to remind ourselves, isn't it, how this day of the Lord, it was a dark day for the nation of Judah, but the coming day of the Lord is going to be a very dark day for planet Earth. And you think of some of the worst days in history. Some of us were talking beforehand about some of the great um, martyrdoms of the past, like the uh, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, when the French Huguenots were slaughtered in their thousands. And it was a bleak day. We think of the Holocaust and uh, the horrors of six million Jews. And yet we're told that there's a day coming, this prophetic day of the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Referring to Daniel is telling us there will never be a day in human history like it either before or after. Such will be the significance of it. And this the invasion that Joel is speaking of, he said this is a, a foreshadowing of that day. It's going to be a, a unique locust invasion like no other. So from verse 3 down to verse 10, He's going to describe now for us this army of locusts, what their characteristics are like. And so he says in verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. 
The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. So the army likened to a devouring fire, actually not just in verse 3, uh, that same picture is taken up again in verse 5. He talks about, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. So a devouring fire, they'll literally, they're going to devour everything in sight just as a fire consumes all in its path. And uh, we've seen some of those things. I remember being up in British Columbia and uh, visiting an area that had had uh, one of these forest fires. And to look at it afterwards, you know, what would normally be lush and green, and just to see the whole, everything just consumed and nothing left but black charred earth. And so that's the picture. So their invasion could also be compared to a scorched earth policy of an invading army. They leave a lush countryside bare and blackened, just as if a forest fire had raged through the area. From seemingly Edenic conditions, like the Garden of Eden, uh, you'd say from paradise to poverty. And, and it's so clear, you can actually see the line where this army is going. And ahead of them, green, lush land. Behind them, you can see this clear demarcation. Behind them, it's like a fire is consumed and there's nothing left. And so this is what is coming. The tot totality of their destructiveness is captured in this simple phrase, nothing shall escape them. We've already seen locusts, they strip everything bare. Nothing shall escape them. Verse 4, their appearance. The appearance of them is the appearance of horses. Now, I'm going to just stop there. It's kind of interesting that the Italian word for locusts is cavalette, which means little horse. Interesting. The German word for locust is heapford, which means hay horse. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting how in different languages, they've, they've looked at locusts and they've used the horse to describe them. And here, uh, of course, before these languages were ever fully developed, uh, Joel describes this locust invasion, and he says the appearance of them is the, has the appearance of horses. And of course, uh, their movement is swift, uh, just like the gallop of horses, like a cavalry charge. And of course, doesn't this remind us, again, foreshadowing, Revelation 9, not that long ago we looked at that chapter about these demon locusts that are going to come, uh, except they're not going to be uh, gobbling up the land. They're going to be attacking people who have not received the mark of, or who have received the mark of the beast. And they're going to be the victims of the demon locust invasion of the book of Revelation. But again, some of the description is very similar. Notice verse 5, he says, Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. So we've kind of we've seen a little description of what they look like. Now he's looking at what do they sound like. And so as these locusts come closer, uh, there's going to be a lot of noise that's going to drown out everything else. First of all, like first of all, like a distant rumble of chariots on the hills. Then, as they come closer, there's like a crackling noise of leaping flames as they can uh, consume tinder in a bushfire, and so uh, it it it's like the clatter of a fully equipped army marching forward. And of course, they're coming in battle formation. And as they come, the noise, the decibels are constantly rising as they get closer and closer. And you can imagine the fear that will strike into people as they hear this. Notice verse 6. Just as we were thinking about their fear, we've got an expression of their faces. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. And so... The, the expression, their faces, those awaiting this approaching army, tells a story without really having to say too much. They're, they're literally pained, writhing, 
And of course, the parallel we saw in Isaiah 13 and verse 8, let me just read it to you again, Isaiah 13, 8, they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth, they shall be amazed one at another, their faces shall be as flames. And so you get the picture. It's so agonizing to be waiting as this army approaches and devours everything in its sight. And people, their faces will be gripped with fear. They'll be, they'll be agonizing at what's coming. And it tells us that they'll be like a woman in childbirth. And such will be the, the pain, the pangs that they will feel as this invasion comes towards them. Verse 7, it says, They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. And so we get this idea that warlike strength, nimble agility, they can surmount every obstacle in their way. Walls are no obstacle to them. Gate, security gates do not keep them out. Uh, the strongest battlements present no difficulty to these invaders. Verse 8, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone. They'll never break rank. They'll just stay in rank. That's the idea. They shall walk everyone in his path. When they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. In other words, all the weapons of man seem to be absolutely powerless to stop them. Nothing seems to avail. This army just keeps marching on, not breaking rank. Let's just go back to the book of Proverbs for a moment. And chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, where we get a, an interesting scripture, verse 27, and it says this, The locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. And so the idea is this, they're, they're marching, their weapons of war normally retard the progress of an enemy attacking but these are not going to be in any way hindered. They're light in weight. They can burst through the munitions of war, fall on weapon, weaponry without injury. Uh, everything man has is useless to stop them. And then verse 9, it says, They shall run to and fro to, in the city. They shall run up the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Like burglars who enter with stealth these vicious invaders gain access to the living quarters of the inhabitants of the city uh, and we get the idea of the speed of it all it mentions they're running more than once verse seven they shall run and of course we we see again uh, them in verse nine they shall run to and fro they shall run upon the wall they shall climb so on and so forth uh, i can't help but think um, about these these locusts. I don't know if any of you have ever seen what has been developed in the terms of robotic robotics in our day. But there's a there's a company there. They're kind of MIT graduates uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they've developed their, their company is called Boston Dynamics. And we're only being shown what's been done several years ago. Uh, it's a lot more advanced now. But they've developed these robots and they can climb walls <laughs> they can uh, they can surmount the, the the greatest of obstacles and they 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 just if you program them they're going to do exactly what you tell them to do and they're going to just be and i just wonder again a foreshadowing of what is to come because these have been developed as weapons of war and and so although this is a literal locus invasion it is reminding us of days to come. And there's going to be, uh, in the terrible great day of the Lord, there's going to be armies that are going to be marching, perhaps many of them like this, that it seems like no obstacle is too difficult. They can surmount them without any problem. And so we, we get this, this grim picture that's being brought before us. And so then he goes on in verse 10, it says, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining. And again, we've got some very, what we'd say, apocalyptic language here. We often see this in terms of the, the end times about the sun uh, and the moon 
dark stars with, withdraw their shining. And so he's using this language to, to describe this phenomena that's about to occur, uh, like the phenomena on Mount Sinai. It, preparing the way, by the way, this kind of language that reminds us, takes us back to Sinai when the blackness of darkness came on the mount. He's getting us ready for the next verse where he's going to identify the leader of this army, and it's none other than the Lord himself. It's the very God who came on Sinai that's bringing this invasion. And so he says that they're, they're, basically their vast numbers can easily block out the sunlight for a time and plunge a community into complete darkness. Their strange movement on the ground can give the impression of an earthquake. You know, when, when you're in an earthquake, one of the things about it, we were in one in the Philippines in 1990, and it was a, a massive earthquake at Mount um, up in Baguio. We were several hours away, but everything around us was moving. Uh, we were sat at the lunch table, and the the light switches were, or the light fittings were were swinging, and it just seemed like everything. And we went outside; even the road was rolling. It was looked like everything was moving, and uh, we seemed to be the only thing standing still. Everything around us was moving. It's just a weird sensation. And so the idea is this: when they come, they give that appearance. However, th there's some thought too that God is bringing more than just the locust invasion. Maybe it was accompanied with signs in the sky and a shaking of the earth, uh, because this is God. God is, you know, God is coming in judgment on His people, and so He tells us uh, that these things are going to happen. And then He says, "And the Lord shall utter," verse eleven, identifying who's behind this, utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great. He is strong that executeth his word, right? He's fulfilling Deuteronomy 28, like he said he would, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? So this is not merely a freak of nature. This cannot be argued away as just being natural events. God is owning responsibility for this invasion. This is not some just what we would say uh, just a uh, a natural phenomenon, and of course, I I think we've got to. It's interesting how our culture is always saying, "Oh, it's just an act of nature," as if nature in itself has its own will and way. And we we need to be steer clear of this kind of thinking. The scripture tells us the whole of creation is groaning and travailing, and the reason it's doing it is because of sin. And sin is the, re the responsible for this. The sin of a people is bringing about the chastening of God. And so it's not a freak of nature. It's an act of God. And the suggestion uh, implicit in the signs of verse 10 is now made explicit. Uh, clearly, we had kind of a picture of divine dealings in verse 10. Now it's clearly spelled out. God is leading the troops by his thunderous voice, directing their movements. He's in command. They're basically serving him. And isn't it amazing? Even all of creation, in a sense, responds to his voice. The hail, he's, he's reserved the hail for the day of battle. <laughs> when he commands, it comes. The whole of creation responds to him, except for man. <laughs> man stubbornly digs his heels in. The locusts, when God says, you come, they come. God says to us, you go, <laughs> we stay put. Just interesting, isn't it? That creation uh, is obeying his commands. He's using creation for his purposes, and yet he wants to use us. And so often we're the unwilling party. And so his power, his might is seen here in all of this. Uh, his threatenings of judgment upon evil are real and will come to pass. And of course, the closing question, and it's quite a question, it says the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can abide it? Are we not reminded of the book of Malachi? Let's just look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2. Malachi 3 verse 2, we read this word, who may abide the day of his coming? 
who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Who may abide the day of his coming? The day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Such is the ferocity of the day. It threatens destruction to all without exception. Who could possibly abide it? And so the destruction is threatened by the Lord, but we're thankful that there is still, although it looks hopeless, there is still a way of escape. Because verse 12 says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even unto me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meal offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. And so basically, the destruction can be averted. It can be averted, but the only way it can be averted is by the repentance of the Lord's people who are, their conduct is the reason that God is bringing this judgment. If they change their conduct, it could be the Lord will repent and withhold the judgment. And so there's still, even though it looks ominous, even though it looks very, very dangerous and very serious, it's not hopeless because God is merciful and there's still hope while God exists there's hope that he will respond to the cries of his people now i'd like us to look just for a moment and this may seem like a sidetrack but it isn't i want us to look at isaiah chapter one because i want you just to see really where we're at in this story uh in the book of joel and i think isaiah one has some good insights into what's really going on here and so i want you to notice in verse six where God gives a diagnosis of his people. He says, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and pure putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And so basically, God gives a, a, a spiritual, as it were, diagnosis of the condition of his own people. And what does he say? They're rotten to the core. From the sole of their feet, the top of their heads. There's no soundness in them whatsoever. And so it, it looks pretty hopeless. Uh, look at verse 11 and down to verse 15, where what the Lord is saying is, just going through your usual rituals is not enough. <laughs> when you're so sinful like that, just going through the regular rituals is not going to cut it. It's not going to cut the mustard. It's not, it's not enough to just go through the rituals of religion when you're in that condition. Look at verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed beasts, and I delight Delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They're, they are a trouble unto me. I am weary of them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And so the idea is this, that the, the, the people were wicked, but religious life continued on as normal. They still did all their regular sacrifices, and yet they were their hearts were dirty. Their hands were not clean. They didn't have clean hands and a pure heart. Uh, they were lifting up their soul to vanity. And so all of this religious stuff cuts nothing. It doesn't, God is not impressed by it. If you're walking in rebellion and sin against God, it doesn't, doesn't do any good. Verse 18, he says, come now, here's the true remedy. Let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins 
be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now notice verse 19. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall de be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, I want you just to get this clear thought. If you're willing and obedient, what, what does he want? He wants them to repent and get back to willing obedience <laughs> to the Lord, right? Instead of sin and rebellion and disobedience, he wants them to change, change their ways. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. God is going to bring blessing. On the other hand, if you refuse and rebel. And so there's, they're at a moment of crisis. What are they going to do? Are they going to continue business as usual? Or are they going to are they going to come and be willing and obedient to what the Lord tells them? So what is what is he telling them? Situation is not hopeless, but there's urgency because this day of the Lord is at hand. There's no time to lose. So Joel and the Lord through Joel calls the nation to the only course of action appropriate in the crisis. They must repent and they must do it now. Notice verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, right? Not, not tomorrow, not next week, now. Now is the time for them to, if there's any hope of God relenting of this impending judgment, they must act now in repentance. There's this urgency. It's not hopeless, but they, they have to act swiftly. And so these next six verses, uh, from verse 12 down to verse 17, Joel's prophecy, it's one of the clearest calls to repentance in the entire word of God. That's why we need to take our time with it. It's a very important little section. And by the way, if you think this has no relevance to us, remind your hearts of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Seven churches. Five out of seven are told expressly by the Lord to repent. The threat is, if you don't repent, I will remove your lampstand. And so corporate repentance is not just for Israel. It's for local churches. <laughs> local churches that are barren and in danger of further barrenness unless they see the urgency of continuing on in their barrenness and they call out to God in genuine repentance. And so the key idea of these verses, and they're divided into two groups of three, the key idea in 12 through 14 is turning to God. And so we want to notice this. And so the idea is turning from the sin and turning to God. That's the idea, turning to God in genuine repentance. All repentance is really, we've been going in the wrong direction and we, we change our minds. We realize we're going in the wrong direction and we turn around and we go back to the right direction. We draw near to God knowing the promise. He will draw near to us. He promised that. And so this idea of turning to the Lord and so the thought of these verses is turn to the Lord. Look at verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me, right? Turn to the Lord with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. When were they to do this? Therefore also now. Now is the time to turn back to the Lord. And by the way, we don't know who's going to listen to this maybe even somebody listening today, and you're backsliding in heart and you know it. The Lord is saying to you, turn back to me and do it now. No point you know, putting it off. No time like the present. Turn now. Therefore also now, say the Lord, turn ye even to me. How, how are they to do it? With all your heart, not, not half-heartedly, with all your heart, and with fasting, with weeping and mourning. We'll talk about those things. We're just kind of doing the overview here. Verse 13, the emphasis is on where to turn. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn to, to the Lord your God. For he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, even with great kindness. So when? Now? 
where to the Lord your God, verse 14, why, he says, who knows if he'll return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meal offering and a drink offering. Why? Because God's character should be enough incentive. He is very gracious. <laughs> and who knows if he'll relent and he'll actually turn it around and bring a blessing. And so turn to God. Uh, and then in verse 15, 16, and 17, it's not so much on turning to God, but how to turn to God. It gets down to the specifics. How are we supposed to do this? Well, he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Here we go again. We're going to talk a lot more about the solemn assembly. How are they going to do it? How is this corporate repentance going to take place? How are we going to come from barrenness to blessing? Well, the place you come is to a solemn assembly. And so what manner of it is it going to take place? Solemn assembly. And then verse 16, who are together? Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber, the bride out of her closet. The whole, everybody, all ages, all sexes come together. This is so important. We all need to get right with God and get our relationship the way it should be. It's the whole community are to come together. Verse 17, the ones who uh, are, are giving leadership in all this, and the reason why we're coming together is this. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, and where is this solemn assembly to take place, weep between the porch and the altar. So then it come to the place where they gather, where God's presence is, to the between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine inheritance to reproach. What are they to do? It's prayer. In, it's interceding. Lord, have mercy on your inheritance for your namesake. For we don't want the heathen to, to, to somehow be able to see negativity connected to you and the way you treat your people. And my time is gone. May the Lord <laughs> encourage us to consider the need for repentance individually and corporately in this day. Amen. <laughs>